there are two aspects that I want to I want to discuss throughout my sessions we'll start today and then we'll wrap up tomorrow and um, I believe that there is a construction that must happen to our understanding of God's mercy if we are to benefit from that whole idea of his mercy most believers know that the mercy of God is available but they do not understand the nature of God's mercy nor how to take advantage of it so in addition to what the speakers have brought and said I hope that God will grant us this understanding in Jesus name um, I believe that when you understand for you to understand the subject of mercy there are two two concepts that you have to understand and study number one is the nature of god you have to study the nature of god otherwise you can never truly understand mercy number two you have to study the nature of man so from from a theological or a doctrinal standpoint i believe and i'm convinced that there are three fields of doctrine that capture the whole idea of the mercy of god number one is called theology please pay attention theology is the study of the nature of god that it is impossible to really truly understand the mercy of God until you understand the nature and the character of God number two is called anthropology anthropology is the study of man whether it is from an archaeological standpoint from a sociological standpoint the when you understand man you will now know why man perpetually needs to live in the reality of God's mercy. Are we learning already? So that there are three expressions, doctrinally speaking, if we are to do justice to the subject of mercy, we must understand theology, the nature of God. Number two, we must understand anthropology, the nature of man. Number three, we have to understand soteriology. Soteriology is the entire discourse of the plan of salvation because the salvation of man is the zenith of the demonstration of God's mercy are we learning so we have theology the study of God anthropology the study of man and then soteriology the study of salvation beginning from the fall of man and so we follow through the law the prophets then Jesus then the implication of all that Jesus came to do that was captured in salvation. Hallelujah. But for the time that I have, I would just want to touch a bit on the nature of God and then the nature of man. Then we try to tie up. I just want to introduce from my session the concept of mercy so that we will understand the foundation and the basis for mercy. I hope that in the session tomorrow we would now consider the administration of mercy the spiritual system by which mercy is administered are we together praise the name of the lord let's look at two scriptures psalm 51 and verse 1 popular scripture on mercy psalm 51 and verse 1 it says have mercy upon me O god according to thy loving kindness take note of that so your mercy is tied to your loving kindness it says according to the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgression scripture number two nehemiah chapter 9 from verse 30 please write it down nehemiah chapter 9 from verse 30 and 31 or let's look at 31 for sake of time it says nevertheless for thy great mercy's sake thou did not utterly consume them nor forsake them for thou art a gracious 
and merciful God. This is the reason why they became recipients of mercy. More than their desire to obtain mercy, there is something about your nature that you are a merciful and a gracious God. Are we learning? One last scripture, Psalms 13 and verse 15. Just to set a foundation and then we'll go into the discussion of the nature. Verse 5, Psalm 13 and verse 5, please. But I have trusted in thy mercy, therefore my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I have trusted in your mercy, therefore my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Let's examine the nature of God in an attempt to understand the basis for this mysterious um, subject of mercy. Not necessarily mysterious as though it were desired to be hidden, but that it takes spiritual intelligence and illumination to really understand mercy. As simple as the concept sounds, um, we can be around it and never truly understand it, appreciate it, or know how to partake of it in experience. So let's examine the nature of God. The Bible tells us very clearly according to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. This, biblically speaking, is about the most striking character of God. It says, God is love. Please say it after me. God One more time, please. We are examining the nature of God. The Bible lets us know that God is love. He does not just love. God is love. It's not just what he does. It is who he is. Are we learning now? God is love. Psalms 45 from verse 8 and 9. Psalm 145. I meant to say 145. Psalm 145. 8 and 9. It says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. These are descriptions. He's helping you understand the nature of this God. The Lord is gracious, it says, and full of compassion, that he is slow to anger and of great mercy. Verse 9. It says, The Lord is good to how many? This is the extent of his benevolence that in communicating compassion and mercy he does not spare. He is good to all and that his tender mercies are over all his works. Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter 34, Genesis chapter 34, we'll read verse 5 and 6. This was Moses up Mount Sinai when he was having a conversation with God over the issue of the commandments. Genesis 34. Did I get that right? Please help me. 5 and 6. Is it Exodus? Exodus 34. Forgive me, please. Exodus. Thank you. I said Genesis. Exodus. Please correct it. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. This was Moses now, up on Sinai. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. What did he say? The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. These are all scriptures that attempt to describe the nature of God. So we see that God is love. We see that God is full of compassion. He is slow to anger. He is rich in love. And that his mercy is over all his works. Now let's study very quickly the nature of man. Now that we have had a fair idea about God as far as his nature is concerned, that his love He's merciful, he's compassionate. Let's look at man. Psalm 51 and verse 5. Hmm. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is an attempt to describe man. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Very, very interesting. No, just keep verse 5. It says that I was shapen in iniquity. Do you know what iniquity is? Iniquity is not sin, as you can see here. The Bible gives a difference. Iniquity comes from the... The, the, the Greek word is a one, and it means an inherent flaw that there is already a default, a default in character inherently. Are we together now? This is the state of the fallen man. He says, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, popular scripture. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. Here's what the Bible says about the heart of man. That the heart is deceitful above all things. For you to appreciate this scripture, you have to find out what else is deceptive. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. That means it is not the only thing that is deceitful. But compared to every other thing that deceives, the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is a description, an x-ray into the heart of man. And the Bible says the heart of man by default, outside of the influence of God's mercy, is deceitful even to the owner of the heart. Hmm. Are we learning? Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. This was a painful assessment of man. When you read from verse 1, the Bible now begins to tell you that when men multiplied, you know, and filled the face of the earth, daughters were born to them and all of that, the, the, the encounter between the, um, those, we, those we call the fallen angels and the daughters of men, the Bible calls them sons of God, benign Elohim, that is the word. You see, and then it says that they saw the daughters of men and so on and so forth. When we get to verse 6, verse 6, uh, in fact, the Bible says, let's look at 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Who saw? This is God assessing man from his standpoint that he saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. How long? Continually. Verse 6. And it repented God that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. So we see that man out of the in, outside the influence of God's grace and mercy has nothing, absolutely nothing that is commendable. Every scripture that describes man is a story of pain and war, the foolishness, the, the deceptiveness of the heart of man. Like I said earlier on, when we understand the nature of God and we can contrast it with the nature of man, then we can now begin to appreciate the concept of his mercy. Hallelujah. According to scripture, I wrote something down here. You may want to pay attention to it. Any action you take that is motivated by compassion is generally called mercy. Any action that is motivated by compassion. The Bible tells us that the Lord is gracious. He is full of compassion. And that is the reason why he is able to show mercy. May I define mercy, therefore? Let me give you three definitions very quickly. And then we'll just tie up a few things and pray. Are we learning? Number one, mercy here I wrote is compassionate treatment of those who are in distress. The first definition of mercy here compassionate treatment because as we'll be learning mercy is not just um, from God towards man and God towards creation 
mercy also extends from man to man are we together if our idea of mercy just stops from God to man then it is not complete because the Bible says blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown are we together now so compassionate treatment of those in distress is called mercy that means when you communicate compassion to those who are in any kind of distress it is called mercy number two the second definition of mercy here is refraining from harm or punishing offenders that means when you refrain from administering harm or punishment to one who is guilty you have shown mercy are we learning now so mercy is refraining from harming or punishing an offender one who is guilty generally speaking now the degree to which you refrain from harming or administering punishment to one who is guilty is called mercy one final definition the disposition to be forgiving to pity or to be kind the disposition to be forgiving to pity or to be kind the disposition to be forgiving to pity or to be kind is called mercy in fact can i add one more definition to it showing care and providing relief is called mercy showing care and providing relief as we are going to be learning the healing ministry is administered under the mercy of god you see that now the entire scope of not just salvation from sin the healing anything that is administered to man that provides relief is sponsored by the mercy of god so you can now understand why blind Bartimaeus did not say son of man heal me uh -uh. he said son of man thou son of david have mercy because what i am looking for is only activated in the presence of your mercy mercy compassionate treatment of those in distress refraining from harming or punishing offenders or they that are guilty the disposition to be forgiving the disposition to pity or to be kind and then finally showing care and providing relief all of these definitions is safe to call every one of these definitions an appropriate definition of mercy we see from all these definitions that there are two expressions of mercy number one the first expression deals with forgiveness or withholding punishment broadly speaking now that whenever we talk about mercy there are two main expressions with based on all these definitions number one is forgiveness or withholding punishment that is the first expression of mercy the second is alleviating pain alleviating distress providing relief from suffering please follow very carefully now we're building now that every time we're discussing the subject of mercy from a kingdom perspective there are two broad angles to it number one it has to do with forgiveness withholding punishment from he or them that are deserving of it the guilty and then number two alleviating pain distress and providing relief from suffering in the kingdom when we talk about mercy your mind must be able to see it from the lens of these two perspectives every time god administers mercy he's doing one of two things number one he is forgiving or withholding punishment from a people who are deserving of it or number two he is alleviating pain 
distress and providing relief from suffering. Are you learning? Why do you need to know this? So that number one, you will appreciate the concept of mercy. Then you will know how to receive the administration of that mercy in your life. And then you will also know how to communicate mercy. Because if you know that mercy is two-dimensional, it has to do with forgiveness and it has to do with relieving of pain and distress. So when the Bible says, blessed are the merciful, now you know what he's saying. That blessed are those who are apt to forgive. Blessed are those who are, are very, very insistent in withholding punishment from them that are deserving. And then blessed are they that support the freedom of men from pain, from relief. That means the healing ministry is the ministry of mercy. The evangelistic ministry is the ministry of mercy. Blessed are the merciful. We'll leave that for tomorrow. But just for you to really be able to understand so that it does not become an abstract concept. Mercy goes beyond pardon from sin. Pardon from sin is wonderful. But even in the faith, you will still need to operate by that understanding of mercy. Mercy is not just for sinners. It is the basis for doing business with God in this kingdom. Are we together now? Yeah. Write this down, please. The foundation and the basis for mercy is compassion. The foundation and the basis for mercy is compassion. That means it is impossible to administer mercy. Mercy is the fruit of compassion. The foundation and the basis for mercy is compassion. Love. What is compassion? Sympathy, pity, concern for the sufferings or the misfortune of others. It is impossible to administer mercy until you have compassion. Now listen very carefully. Compassion has to do with feelings. Mercy has to do with action. You see that? When compassion is emotion, it is no longer called compassion. It is called mercy. Mercy is the fruit of compassion. Hmm. When it has to do with mercy, the Bible uses the expression show mercy or have mercy. It does not say think mercy. It does not say feel mercy because mercy is always action. Thou shall arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her, yea, the set time. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Are we learning? So the foundation for mercy is compassion, love. It is impossible to be able to administer mercy except you have love. The reason why God is merciful is because God is love. The reason why man can be merciful is because man is also a, a recipient of that love nature. And if allowed to be activated through faith, then you can also be an administrator of mercy. So why are we bankrupt of mercy in our world today? From a standpoint of men to men. The simple reason is because we do not dwell in love. Let me define for you, let me give you my definition of love. I've studied a bit on the subject of love, believe me. And here is my conclusion. Love is the absence of self. That is it. You can literally gauge love to the degree to which self is not there. And you can gauge lack of love 
you can use the index of self as the ultimate test. Love is the absence of self. More than a feeling, more than the emotional construct of your heart, you can know whether love is present in a place by checking whether self is there. Love and self is like light and darkness. The moment there is self, there cannot be love. God's love. So true love is the absence of self. In fact, listen, the nature of love mandates that you cannot find fulfillment until you communicate that love to an object outside of you. The very character of true love mandates that you cannot derive satisfaction in just loving yourself. You must communicate that love to an object outside you to be satisfied. That is why naturally speaking, the character of love is that it gives. For God so loved the world that he... Forget about what he gave. Just know that he gave. So anything you so love, you must give to it. If you so love a vision, you give to it. Your time, your intelligence. If you so love God, you give to it. If you so love your spouse, you give. Giving. When giving is absent, there is no love. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave many things. Ultimately, his son. He gave us his spirit. He gave us his life. He gave us access to every spiritual blessing that resides in the heavenly places, the Bible says. God so loved that he gave. Mercy is a fruit of compassion. So the real prayer is not make me merciful. Uh -uh. The real prayer is that the love of Jesus and his compassion will grow that we will grow in love because when you grow in love truthfully it will become natural to communicate mercy are we together yes most times you would see in jesus's healing meetings the bible would say he was moved with compassion not moved with power he was moved with compassion. He looked at the people and saw them like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus wept twice in the Bible. One of it was at the tomb of Lazarus. The other was when he looked at Jerusalem. The Bible says he wept over them and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If you had known, even in this your time, the things that pertain for your peace, but now they are hid from you. Praise the name of the Lord. The foundation for biblical mercy is compassion. Did I define compassion? The Bible defines it. And here's my definition of compassion. The ability to be touched with the feelings of people's infirmity is called compassion. The ability, say for we do not have a high priest who has not been touched with the feelings of our infirmity. It is the reason why even when Jesus was done, the work of salvation was over. He still went to heaven as a man and he sat down there and continued a ministry of intercession, not for himself, for the saints. Because the character of love is that it finds satisfaction bringing joy to an object outside of itself. He seated at the right hand of the Father and he makes intercession. Do you know how his intercession is sponsored by his compassion more than his power? That means he looks at the father and says, Father, if I did not become a man, it would be easy for me to blame these people. But I, I am a man. I know what it means to be hated for a right cause. That is the basis of his intercession. He has been there. He was hated for no cause. He blessed people and they said, crucify him. They ate of his bread, ate the fish, and they still said, crucify him. So when he sees someone who is loved for serving God and persecuted in a family, his intercessory ministry is based on the fact that there is a point of contact. Can, you, can I tell you this? One of the ways that God makes great people 
is to allow them go through several things that connect them with the feelings of the people they will be helping in future. So that when you stand before people, he may not necessarily cause the tragedies, but in his wisdom, he can walk out a way. So when you are a great person, either as a leader, a man of God, a businessman, part of the many reasons why you are great is because your life is full of stories. There are memories that connect you to several angles of people's pain. So many times when people are shouting, you say, leave them. And they say, sir, I, I leave them. Should we command fire down? And Jesus said, no. Do you not know what spirit you are of? You know people who have grown because their lives are full of history. God has brought them through seasons and they have been, they have been in touch with several levels of pain, disappointment, shame. They understand the nature of man. Nothing surprises them again. Are you learning? Yes. So Jesus is in heaven. He's making intercession. And the basis of his intercession is that as a high priest, he, even though he is the son of the living God, he was subject to like passion. He was hungry. He was thirsty. Jesus tasted lack. He was hungry and the Bible did not hide it that he went to a tree hoping to get food. Is it in your Bible? And that he did not get the food. He did not just say, tree, I love you. He expressed his frustration in the presence of tiredness. So when he sees weariness on earth, he can connect to it. The preacher is not a bad man. He's just weary. Five years without results, that human nature is crying. And that becomes the basis of his compassion, his intercession. When, listen... There is a way you become too innocent, you cannot really administer mercy. Because you have been shielded from too many things in life. So it is difficult for you to connect with people's pain and tears. Why is the preacher shouting like that? What is there in persecution, you say? What is there in losing in this business? You just lost one billion. So what? Just pray and God will help you. When you see great people keep quiet, it's proof of growth. They, there are stories in their lives that can connect to the pain of the people they are ministering to. Let me tell you this. If you study the dynamics of the anointing, you find out that your pain is a gift because that becomes the door. Do you know why Jesus in heaven today still has the scars on his hand? You would think one who resurrected by the power of the spirit, all those scars should heal. That scar that was a symbol of shame today is the basis of his honor. Every time he looks at those hands, they remind him of his, of his compassion, the frailty of man. So he deals with us from the lens of his compassion. But thou, O oh Lord, art a shield for me. My glory, you lift my head. But thou, O oh Lord, art a shield for me. My glory, the lifter up of my head. You see, when I pray for the sick and I minister, I don't just minister because the Bible says to do it. I have been sick before. Really, really sick. I've been diagnosed with conditions that were not good. And the Lord preserve the pain of that experience. And that becomes the sponsor and the trigger to the anointing. When I see someone going through pain today, it is not just because the Bible says to heal and to pray for the person. There is, there is, I have, I have in the archives of my life, there is, there is the gift of pain that was taught. And it today becomes the basis. It sponsors patience. It sponsors forbearance. When you see people who do not show mercy in our life, in our world today, there are only two explanations. Number one, they are children. Or number two, they have not really faced the reality of life.
You see that the older people are, even those who were temperous when they were young, something happens to them. They become like children again because 50 years of living in this wicked world should teach you a lesson whether you are ready to learn or not. It teaches you so many things. So when they brought the woman who was caught in adultery, in the very act, the Bible says, Interesting that they didn't bring the man. You don't commit adultery with yourself. And yet they spared the man and dragged the woman, threw her before Jesus and said, this woman was caught in the very act. What do you say? If you come as a prophet, you cannot fight other prophets before you. So let's hear what you will say. And Jesus was writing on the ground. And here's what he said. He didn't say, I am Jesus. He didn't say, leave me alone. He said, he, among all of you who are standing here, based on the nature of man, he who does not have sin, stone her. And the Bible says they were convicted from the oldest. Next verse. From the who? They were convicted by their own conscience, one by one, beginning from... The one who had lived longest on earth, he had more stories and he reminded him, Mr. Man, you've lived long in this earth. Are you saying you've lived so long and you've not become wise by reason of experience? Rabbi, are you that innocent? And the Bible says one by one. That one statement was a message reminding all of them of their desperate need for mercy. And the Bible says, on the basis of that, they left. And he said, woman, where are your accusers? Where are they? One revelation drove them away. So one of the ways to drive accusers is to remind them that every time you point fingers at people, it lets you know that based on the standpoint of man, unassisted by God, nobody has the moral credence nobody has the moral credence to point an accusing finger against any woman where are thine accusers and he said go see no more and the woman left she left justified he said neither do i condemn you go and see no more hallelujah Man at his best is still flawed based on God's standard. This is an uncomfortable truth we must admit. It says, in sin did my mother conceive me. So before acting out anything, the justice system of God already declares that you are not qualified. You do not meet that standard. Because you see, the condition to carry the righteousness of God or the condition to carry the life of God and the Holy Spirit is that you must have righteousness equal to that of Jesus. Not like, equal to that of Jesus. The Holy Spirit only honors whoever carries the righteousness of Jesus. And every attempt by man to match up to that standard, the Bible says that our righteousness corporately is as filthy rags. Are we together? Yes. So the basis and the foundation for mercy is compassion. 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 When you see what Jesus has done in your own life, when you see the depth of his love, the Bible says what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us in that we be called the sons of God. And the whole process that led to you being the son of God, Jesus Christ, hung upon the cross, went through that nature. When you remember it, he's telling you that the guys who brought the woman who was caught in adultery, there was something they forgot that gave them the energy to drag that woman. That if you remember, you will be very slow to anger. You see that? Yeah. One of the ways that the spirit of anger works is that it traps away your thoughtfulness. It takes away your ability to think so that you just act without thinking because the moment you can be thoughtful, 
somewhere in your life you will remember that from January last year to December how long did I experience the mercy and the kindness of God and your answer will be every month and every day and every week based on that you see that yeah when you pass a road and see a prayer warrior's car inside a ditch and you who did not open your Bible for one month you pass safely and you go he reminds you by that experience that it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed when you see all your believing neighbors struggling with COVID and crying and you who was running around and breaking every rule you know both human governmental divine and yet God kept you you will not credit that to your righteousness very quickly you will know how to admit the key to understanding mercy is to contrast God's love and man's man's failure man's inability to help himself while I was just seated at the the rotunda they are just listening to you sing I heard you sing that song I'm the one you have shown mercy and it really touched my heart because I was praying I said Lord may they listen to what they are saying you look beyond me yo. that's what I want you to think about you look beyond me yo. leave the other part of the song you know it That was the basis that he looked beyond me so what did he look at if you look beyond me what was beyond me that you looked at that became the basis of the mercy because if you looked at me all that you would see is that which is deserving of condemnation and destruction very wise scripture based song beyond me to who? Who did he look at that suddenly made me not to become an object of his wrath? What did he see? I'm interested in what he saw. What did he see that suddenly made a criminal not to be a criminal again? What did he see that made someone who would have walked in a course all the days of his life? What did he see? He looked beyond me, oh. beyond. You looked beyond me oh. Please take it high for me. Leave all the parts you look past this and that, whatever he looked at. Just my own is that he looked beyond me. If I'm paying attention to this dear man of God seated in front here, and I'm looking at you and then all of a sudden, I don't focus on you again. You see me looking. That means something else has stolen my attention. Assuming I want to punish you and suddenly I turn and I start laughing. What happened? That means there is a conversation behind you that you're not even aware of. You look beyond me. Oh. You look beyond me. Oh. That I'm the one you have shown mercy. You have shown me mercy. You have shown mercy. Can I tell you this? Honestly, when you understand the mercy of God, sometimes you will even be embarrassed sharing testimonies. It will take the grace of God because you know that there is somewhere in that equation that you don't understand how the answer fully came. There was a gap in that equation yes i prayed yes i fasted yes i walked in keeping with what the bible says but but oh peter there are times you can fish there are times you will go to the sea where fish should be there are times your boat can be fine there are times your net is good yet you will not catch fish at that point it was not your skill that went wrong you went to the sea like you should go you went with a boat like you should have you went with a net that was functioning at that point you don't need skill again 
you need the one who can administer mercy. Remember my definition of mercy? To take away that pain. He said, cast your net to the right side. And he caught fish. And the moment Peter caught fish, do you know what happened to him? When you look at the, the account in John 21, the moment he caught fish, he didn't call him a sinner. Peter said, go away from me. I am a sinner. There was something about the administration of mercy that brought conviction. He didn't say, Peter, you are a sinner. No! Cast your net to the right side. You've done your best. Let me show you that I can look beyond you. When people see what God is doing in and through my life, many times people ask me what is the secret and it's a very difficult question to answer because one, I don't tell lies and two, I, I want to tell the whole truth. But the truth is that there are gaps in this thing. Ours is to keep walking in keeping with the truths that scripture provides. But there is an equation, there is a gap in the equation of a man's destiny that only the size of God can fill. One plus one according to mathematics should be two. If your one plus one is zero, the thief is there in that equation because he's the one who takes. But if one plus one suddenly becomes one million, you need to check. That means it's not only one plus one that is there. One plus one plus Jesus equals to whatever answer he puts there. Listen to me. Because we live in an arrogant world that prides in beating your chest. There is a healthy divide between confidence and arrogance. We make our boast only in the Lord that we are recipients of his mercy. But chances are excellent that when God begins to do great and mighty things in and through our lives, when the spotlight is on you, chances are excellent that you don't want to just go out of that spotlight and allow Jesus to be glorified. So it's easy we can say, I did this, I did that. But there are those who know, ah, you look past my sin, my guilt, my shame, and poured your love. You look beyond me, oh. you look beyond me, oh. you look past my sin, my guilt, my shame, and poured your love. You look beyond me, oh. the basis for genuine mercy is compassion the real prayer is not to be merciful the real prayer is that the love of Jesus and his compassion the fortitude to be touched with the feelings of people's infirmity when that happens to you when you hear that someone's house is on fire you don't start asking questions like who was careless there you run quickly because you know that except the Lord watches over his city, there can be watchmen, but they will watch in vain. The Bible says it is vain to wake up in the morning and to sleep late in the night, only to eat the bread of sorrow. It is only God that gives his beloved sleep. Have you seen families that were well-cultured and disciplined, took care of their children, prayed and fasted every month, yet the children eventually became like drug barons and armed robbers? You can't say they didn't give their best. The parents will tell you, I gave my children the, the, the training of a man of God as children. And yet you see another rough family somewhere where they only see at the end of the day. Once it's morning, nobody knows where whoever is. We only verify that by 11.30 at least everyone is back home. And in the midst of it, a scattered, visionless young, vicious, visionless young boy. While he's moving around, he will meander into a church, one revival program somewhere, and fire falls upon the head of that small boy. Ten years later, he now becomes a great man who is going to help the family that seemed well-cultured and trained. 
How about a sincere lady who keeps herself loving Jesus and then is raped by some criminals? And then a bad girl who keeps going from left, right, and center. And at the end of it, it looks as if she's never done anything wrong. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. The mercy of God is not a license for licentiousness. But I can tell you this. When you look at your life and you are thoughtful, at the end of it, there is only one sentence that will come out of your mouth. Thank you, Jesus. I am truly a product of your mercy. There are people here, you probably lost your job years, maybe two, three, four years, and yet you've not had to beg. You were even giving out some money to others who are working. And you cannot really tell how quarter to shame that mercy comes again. The mercy of God is the fruit of his love. Please do not forget this simple message this afternoon. I'm introducing for you the concept of mercy from a kingdom standpoint. That there are two dimensions to the mercy of God. His ability to forgive and to pardon. And his ability to take away pain and relief. They are all administered by his mercy. And that his mercy comes from his compassion. The mercy that flows from your life to others will also come from a standpoint of compassion. Compassion. So when God instructs you to set up a charity organization, say for instance, and help the poor and the needy, ambition will not take you so far. You will be tired one day. But if it comes from compassion, you will remember, it would have been me. You will master the ability to put yourself in the position of many people. And you will find out that you will live a profoundly compassionate life, administering the mercy of God. Where then is our boasting? Where then is our pride? Where then is the self-glorification? We are absolutely recipients of his mercy, his grace, his compassion. This is the revelation that I live with. Honestly speaking, I'm not just saying this because I'm standing and I'm preaching. It is, it, is my, it is the construct of my understanding. We're going to pray. By his mercy, he's treated you beyond what you deserved. By his mercy, He's shown forgiveness. He's withheld punishments. By his mercy, he's alleviated pain, stress. And as we'll be learning tomorrow, I'll be teaching us the administration of God's mercy. Because you see, as free as God's mercy is, sadly, not everyone will truly be a recipient of that mercy. You will find out that as free as the mercy of God is, there is a system of administration. The Bible says, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. Listen carefully. It says we may obtain. Obtain means receive. And anything that is given to you, there is a skill to receiving it. If you do not know how to receive, you cannot have. Because the law is that you only have what you receive. Mark 11, 23 and 24. Jesus was teaching us how to receive. And then in verse 24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, 24 now, Therefore I say unto you, he says, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that thou receivest them, and thou shalt have them. Receiving and having are two different things. You only have what you have received. If you have not received it, you cannot have it. Receiving is spiritual. Having is the manifestation physically. The Bible says we should come boldly to obtain mercy. To obtain mercy. To obtain mercy. Please rise up on your feet as we pray this afternoon. Two prayer points very quickly within the minute or two that we have left. 
The first prayer tonight is a prayer of thanksgiving. Now your eyes have been opened further to see that I'm a product of God's mercy, genuinely and sincerely. And it takes thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness. The hymn writer says, count your blessings. He says, name them one by one. He says, and it will surprise you. That means if you are not surprised, you should, you should continue counting. If you are counting and you are not surprised, then it means you are doing it wrongly. Keep counting. Can you lift your hands? I give you one minute to just tell him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Think of 2021 and tell him thank you for his mercy. Don't act like you did not go through 2021. Remember. Remember his faithfulness. Remember his love. Remember his display. Some of you sadly following, probably you were kidnapped by all kinds of people and yet by his mercy you were preserved. Some of you as hostile as last year seemed to be, it was your most productive year. Remember his mercy. Beyond me. Above and beyond my efforts. Above and beyond any display of righteousness on my own part. Are you praying? Tell him thank you. Offer unto him that incense of worship and thanksgiving. Lord, I remember I am thoughtful. Thoughtful enough to know that you have kept me. Mother, pray and thank him for your children. Father, thank him for capacity to provide that in the midst of the harsh economic climate, you were still upper, faithfully so. Can you thank him for salvation? Oh, yes. Salvation. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Blameless, justified by the blood of the Lamb, by he who is rich in mercy, from the abundance of his mercy, look what he's done with our lives. Someone is saying thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I'd like you to pray one prayer. You're going to ask the Lord to burn into your spirit the revelation of his mercy so that you will walk in that consciousness. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful. And remember that your activity, your action is a product of your convictions, your thoughts. If your mind is full of this revelation of mercy naturally, that is what will flow out of you. So you are going to pray that God will grant you grace. For some of you who are quick to point accusing fingers at people, quick to laugh, you point at your loved ones, point at family members, grant, pray that the Lord will grant you a change of heart, that there will be a circumcision of heart to truly be merciful, that you will be the first to cry with those who are weeping and tell them Jesus is able to help. When you hear that someone has lost their child or someone is in pain, you remember it would have been me. Go ahead and pray. Grant me the grace by your spirit. Please pray one minute and I speak over you and you're, we're done. Pray. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of a man. 
Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own. I love this part. Here in our weakness, you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we falling before your throne. Let's sing it to him. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace that our hearts always hunger. Oh, our hearts always Salvation comes from His mercy. Healing comes from His mercy. Restoration of years and things come from His mercy. His provision comes from His mercy. Let me declare over your life that in the name of Jesus, the Son of the living God, this year, 2022, I stand in agreement with your pastor, the angel over this church, and I decree and declare over your lives and over your destinies. This will be a year that you will see a display of God's mercy in a way that will surprise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who had a filthy garment and Satan coming to accuse him, and he turned and said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Is this not a reed that I have taken out of fire? And then he removed that garment. I pray for someone here. Every legal access the devil has to plague you, to buffet your family, we call that legal hold keeping you in pain, that legal hold recycling tragedies in your life by the blood of the eternal covenant. We decree and declare, you are set free now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray for you, everything the blood purchased for us in redemption, by the spirit of faith, I administer it to your destiny. In the name of Jesus, the Lord bless you. The Lord honor you. In Jesus' name.